Today we're going to take a look at the question, how can we evaluate limits? In our last lesson, we looked at how we can use a table or a graph to evaluate a limit by getting closer and closer to a specific value. What we're going to do today is take a look at some limit laws that we can use to help us find limits quicker and more accurately. First, there are two basic limit laws. The first is that the limit as x approaches a of x, since x is a straight line with no holes or gaps or any funny uh, actions happening on the graph, we can say that that limit is going to equal whatever number we're checking on the graph. The second limit is as x approaches a of some constant where c is just any number, but there's no x's in there, then that is going to always approach that constant, or c. These two are our basic limit laws, and important that we should be very comfortable calculating those limits as soon as we see them. So for example, if I ask what is the limit as x goes to negative 4 of x, we should know right away that's going to equal the number, or the negative 4. Similarly, if I want to know what the limit is as x approaches 7 of 2, 2 is just a number or a constant. This function is always equal to 2 regardless of what x is. So even at 7, x is still, or the function is still, equal to 2. In addition to the basic limit laws, there are six other properties of limits or limit laws that we should be comfortable working with. We'll list all six here, and then we'll look at some examples of how these limit laws can be worked out. First is the sum or difference, as they both work the same. And the idea here is if we take the limit as x approaches some number a of two parts that are added together, maybe f of x plus g of x, that is actually the same as if we took the limits of the two parts individually, the limit as x approaches a of the f of x, and added the limit as x approaches a of g of x. If we take the two parts individually, we'll get the same result. And it works for subtraction also. So I'm going to change this to plus or minus. The next limit law is what we call the constant multiplier. Where we're going to take the limit as x approaches a of some constant times something with x in it. The way we can work here is that constant actually is multiplied by whatever the limit as x approaches a of that function actually is. We also have the product rule, which says if I want the limit as x approaches a of f of x times g of x, two things multiplied together, we can actually take the limits of the two parts, the limit as x approaches a of the first part, times the limit as x approaches a of the second part, or the g of x. Same idea works for a quotient, because really multiplication and division are just inverse reciprocals of each other. So limit as x approaches a of f of x divided by g of x. That is equal to the limit as x approaches a of f of x divided by the limit as x approaches a of g of x.
we also have what's called the power rule. The power rule says if I'm interested in finding a limit as x approaches a of some function that is raised to some type of exponent, we can find the limit first and then raise the answer to some exponent. And because exponents and radicals are really the same thing, we can extend this to number 6, what we call the radical rule, which is that the limit as x approaches a of the square root of some function is equal to the square root of the limit. So I'm going to highlight all six of these limit laws as important limit laws that we know and understand. But this is a case, as is often the case with calculus, is it's more important that we understand how to use the six rules than it is that we can actually quote the six rules from memory. Because if we understand the process of what we're doing, we just have to straight out solve the problems instead of going through memorizing a whole bunch of formulas, which should not be the goal in any calculus class. Basically, what we're saying here is that we can take the limits of the pieces we can, and we can add and subtract them. We've got constant multipliers. Limit pieces can be multiplied, divided, exponents, radicals. We can just take the limits of the individual pieces. Maybe it's easier to explain with some examples. If we want the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 3x plus 4, we know from our limit laws that this added and subtracted can be broken into three pieces. We also know that the exponents and constants can be pulled outside of the limit. So what this really means we can do is we can take the limit as x approaches 2 of the x and then square it minus 3 times the limit as x approaches 2 of the x and add 4. Actually add the limit as x approaches 2 of the 4. Now we have the two basic limit laws that says the limit of x is the number and that the limit of a constant is equal to the constant. And so if we plug that in, the limit as x approaches 2 of x becomes 2 squared minus 3 times the limit as x approaches 2 of x is just 2 plus 4 and I can plug this into my calculator, and we'll end up with 2. Let's try another one. The limit as x approaches negative 1 of the square root of x plus 5. Again, limits go through exponents, radicals, pluses, minuses, fractions. So what we really can say is this is the square root of the limit as x goes to negative 1 of x plus the limit as x goes to negative 1 of 5. And we know the limit of x is the number. The limit of a constant is the constant. So this is the square root of negative 1 plus 5, which is the square root of 4, or also 2. What you might notice here is instead of doing all the work of putting that limit through all the pieces, what we're really doing is, whenever possible, we're taking the number we're working with and plugging it in to the x. In summary, what we're really doing is what's called direct substitution.
In other words, if I had an example like the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 4 over x squared plus 2x plus 1, what that really means is we can put the 1 in for the x to see what's happening around 1. If I put the 1 in, we get 1 squared minus 4 over 1 squared plus 2 times 1 plus 1. 1 minus 4 is negative 3, and 1 plus 2 plus 1 is 4. And so the limit as x approaches 1 is negative 3 fourths. So in summary, the easiest way we can calculate a limit is to directly plug that number into the function. However, that doesn't always work perfectly. And so we've got a couple techniques to handle what we do if direct substitution doesn't quite work. So let's call this additional techniques that we will use when substitution does not work. So first, we're going to find the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x squared plus 4x plus 3 over 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. Now what I want to notice is when we plug negative 3 in, especially interested in the denominator, we get 2 times 9 minus 15 minus 3, which is 0. So what we're noticing is substitution divides by 0. We can't divide by 0. We can't have 0 in the denominator. So we need an additional technique. Our additional technique is going to be to factor and reduce. Hopefully, when we do this, we'll be able to actually take the limit through direct substitution. So we're going to take the limit as x goes to negative 3. The numerator factors nicely. x squared is x times x. 3 is 3 times 1. Both positive gives us 4x in the middle. In the denominator, 2x squared is 2x times x. 3 is 3 times 1. Is that the right order? 6 and 1. If we do plus 6 and a minus 1, it will work. And what's really nice there is now you see that x plus 3 reduces out. And so we're left with the limit as x goes to negative 3 of x plus 1 over 2x minus 1. Now direct substitution works great, because no longer does our denominator equal 0. We're no longer dividing by 0. Instead, we have negative 3 plus 1 over 2 times negative 3 minus 1, which is negative 2 over negative 7. And a negative divided by a negative is a positive. So for our final answer, this limit equals 2 sevenths. So our first technique, if we're dividing by 0, we can factor and hopefully reduce out the part that equals 0. Here's a second problem. The limit as x goes to 8 of the square root of x plus 1 minus 3 over x minus 8. Again, we have the same note. If we substitute in the denominator, 8 minus 8 will be 0. So substitution.
divides by 0. We can't do that. So we need another trick. This time, we can't factor because there's a radical in there. However, there's a trick that we use with radicals. If radicals are getting inconvenient, we'll get rid of the radicals by multiplying by the conjugate. This is similar to what we did in pre-calculus and algebra. When we were rationalizing the denominator, we multiplied by the conjugate. This time, we're going to rationalize the numerator and see if that helps us. So we'll change the sign in the middle. Everything else is the same. The square root of x plus 1 and 3 is the same. But instead of subtracting, we're going to add in the numerator and the denominator. When we do that, the numerator becomes nice. Limit as x goes to 8 still. Because these are conjugates, a sum and a difference, the first part is squared. And when we square a square root, we just get the inside stuff, x plus 1. Then it's always a minus. And then we square the last part. 3 squared is 9. Over, let's keep the denominator factored. x minus 8 times the square root of x plus 1 plus 3. Well, that's nice because in the numerator, we can simplify. And notice 1 minus 9 is x minus 8. We still have the same denominator. Don't need to multiply that out because we want to stay factored so we can divide out that x minus 8. Remember, if everything divides out, there's still a 1 up there. That doesn't disappear. And so now we're taking the limit as x goes to 8 of 1 over the square root of x plus 1 plus 3. Now we can plug our number in because the denominator no longer will equal 0. We have 1 over the square root, plugging 8 in, 8 plus 1 plus 3 equals 1 over the square root of 9 is 3, plus 3 is 6. And we now know our limit is 1 sixth. Another example. Let's find the limit as x approaches 3 of 1 over x plus 2 minus 1 over 5 all over x minus 3. Again, we have the same note, the same problem. Substitution means we're dividing by 0. We can't divide by 0. However, We've dealt with complex fractions, fractions and fractions before. We multiply top and bottom by the least common denominator, which in this case is a 5 and an x plus 2. So we'll multiply by 5x plus 2 and just distribute it through 5x plus 2 and the denominator also by 5x plus 2. When we do that, the x plus 2s and the 5s divide out. Be careful with the negative. It's going to have to distribute through the parentheses. Don't get in trouble with that negative. Let me get us some more whiteboard space. So now we have the limit as x goes to 3 of 5 minus x minus 2, distributing the negative all the way through, all over x minus 3 times 5 times x plus 2. Clean up by reduced by combining like terms in the numerator. The limit as x goes to 3 of 3 minus x 
over x minus 3 times 5 times x plus 2. We've got our subtraction backwards with the 3 minus x and the x minus 3. But that's OK, because if we remember from pre-calc, those can reduce out if there's a negative 1 left behind. The negative 1 swaps the order of the subtraction. So now we have the limit as x goes to 3 of negative 1 over 5 times x plus 2. Now we can do direct substitution, because no longer are we dividing by 0. So negative 1 over 5 times 3 plus 2, which is negative 1 over 5 times 5, or 25. So there's three tricks here. And these three tricks are going to come back again when we're talking about derivatives. So it's good to take a moment to go over what we just did. Uh, the first trick we did is we can find a limit by factoring and reducing. We also can get rid of radicals by multiplying by conjugates. And we also can get rid of complex fractions by multiplying top and bottom by the LCD. Three tricks that are going to be very useful to us so that we can use that direct substitution in order to find a limit. While we're talking about finding limits, though, I want to go back to the discussion we had about the two-sided limits and how we can handle those. If you remember in our previous lesson, we talked about coming in from the left and coming in from the right. Well, for a two-sided limits, the left and the right must be equal. So if we're working with a piecewise function, like f of x is equal to x plus 3 if x is greater than negative 3, and it's equal to x squared if x is less than or equal to negative 3, we need to consider at negative 3 what's happening on the left and the right. So first, let's look at the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left of f of x. From the left, we're dealing with smaller values of negative 3. Smaller values less than or equal to 3 is x squared. So we'll directly plug in the negative 3 into the x squared, or negative 3 squared, which is 9. Let's compare that with the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the right of f of x. Coming from the right, we're talking about bigger values, or x is greater than negative 3. So that's the x plus 3. Direct substitution, negative 3 plus 3 is equal to 0. And what you'll notice is those two limits are not the same. So what does that mean about the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x? Well, we know it does not exist. Let's do one more example of a two-sided limit with a piecewise function. Let's look at f of x equals. 2x if x is less than 2, and x squared if x is greater than or equal to 2. So what's the limit at 2? Well, we got to come in from each side. The limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x, from the left, those are the smaller values where x is less than 2. So let's plug in 2. 2 times 2 is equal to 4. Looking at the other side, the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of f of x, coming from the right means we want bigger values or when x is greater than or equal to 2. So we'll plug it into x squared. 2 squared 
is equal to 4. This time, you notice we have the same value for both the left and the right-sided limits. When we have the same value, then we can say the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x still does exist. In fact, that limit is 4, whatever is the same on both the left and the right side. So the important thing with piecewise functions is we have to be equal to the same number on both sides of the function. With our limit discussion, we talked a bit about infinite limits. So let's look at how we can work with infinite limits, calculating them with this whole idea of substitution. With infinite limits, there are two properties that will help us calculate the infinite limits. First property is that the limit as x approaches a from the left of 1 over x minus a. If we're coming in from the left on this guy, this function will always go to negative infinity. Because all the pieces are positive, it's going to go down to negative infinity. Similarly, as x approaches a from the right, of 1 over x minus a. Coming in from the right, we're going to go up to positive infinity. These two limits are going to be the key to finding infinite limits by hand rather than going through the table method or the graph method. Let's first look at the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of x plus 1 over x squared minus 4. We can't directly plug 2 in because it makes it undefined. So we would start to factor to see if that helps us, to see if we can remove the discontinuity. So x plus 1 over x squared minus 4 is x plus 2 times x minus 2. But the frustrating part there is that x minus 2 doesn't divide out. So we can't divide out the bad part. So what we'll do is we'll isolate the bad part in a separate fraction, 1 over the bad part. This is going to give us the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of x plus 1 over x plus 2 times 1 over x minus 2. Now we can do direct substitution on the good part. And for the bad part that's been isolated, we're coming in from the left. And we know when we come in from the left, that's going to go to a negative infinity. So let's look at each of these pieces. Plugging 2 in, we've got 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 2 times the negative infinity. Well, 2 plus 1 is 3. 2 plus 2 is 4 times the negative infinity. The answer here is going to be infinity, but what we have to decide is we've got a positive times a negative is going to equal a negative. And so we end up with this function going out to negative infinity. Let's do that one more time where we isolate the bad part. Let's come in from the other direction. Let's take the limit as x goes to 2 from the right of the x plus 1 over x squared minus 4. And again, we start out the same as x going to 2 from the right by factoring the denominator to x plus 2, x minus 2. 
and then isolating the bad part as a fraction, 1 over that. And so we end up with the limit as x goes to 2 from the right of x plus 1 over x plus 2 times the bad part of 1 over x minus 2. This time, we're going in from the plus or positive side. That's the second property. That's now going to go to a positive infinity. So when we make our substitution step, we're going to plug positive infinity in for that second part. Plugging 2 in, we have 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 2 times positive infinity, which is 3 fourths times positive infinity. A positive times a positive is positive. This graph's going to positive infinity from the right. I have one more limit trick that I want to look at. We call this guy the squeeze theorem. And it's particularly useful to find limits with trig properties. The idea with the squeeze theorem is if I've got some function and I don't know what the limit is, but I can find a function that goes above it and a function that goes below it so that they all meet in the center at the same exact point. So we've got one that's always above. one that's always below, but they all meet together in the same point. At that same point, they will all have the same limit if they all meet at the same point. My picture doesn't show them meeting at the same point really well. But the idea is the top one, the bottom one, and the middle function all converge together at that same point in the center. Then they all have the same exact limit. So let me show you what this looks like. Let's say we want to know the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times the cosine of x. We don't have a limit rule yet that says we can just plug the number into the cosine, just into polynomials, into fractions, into multiplication, into radicals, but not into cosines. So we need to use the squeeze theorem to get at it. And how the squeeze theorem works is we're going to look particularly at the cosine and say one thing we know about the cosine, not the sine, the cosine. The cosine of x has a very bounded domain. It's always between a negative 1 and a positive 1. Same thing for the sine. So what we want to do is manipulate this inequality so that it looks like the entire function x squared times the cosine. Well, the center is just missing a multiply by x squared. So if we do that on all three parts, we end up with negative x squared is less than or equal to x squared cosine x, which is less than or equal to x squared. We can take the limit of each of these parts. The limit as x goes to 0 of negative x squared is less than or equal to the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared cosine x, which is less than or equal to the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared. And what's nice about this is the left and the right we can do direct substitution on. If I plug in 0, we get negative 0 squared, which is just 0, is less than or equal to the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared cosine x, which is less than or equal to, here we have a polynomial, 
direct substitution. We plug 0 in. 0 squared is just 0. So if the limit is less than 0 and greater than 0 or equal to, it must be equal to 0. So the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared cosine x is equal to 0 because it's been squeezed in between these other two functions that both go to 0. They all are at the same point. They all have the same limit. One is always below, and one is always above. So that wraps up our discussion of all of the limit tricks. The basic idea is direct substitution. We want to plug the number that, we're take, that we have for the limit into the function and simplify. We have a couple tricks we did if that doesn't work to get it to a point that it does work. But ultimately, if we can plug the number in, it's very easy to take the limit.